Welcome to the Lunch Rentals Podcast. I'm Ryan Hill. This week, it's a photo gear rodeo. I'll get Joey and Zach's opinions on a few recent gear announcements, and for even more expert information, we brought in our first returning guest, Barney Britton, Senior Editor of DP Review. Here are Joey, Zach, and Barney. Welcome to the Lens Rentals Podcast. Uh, I am here with Zach and Joey of Lens Rentals and uh, Barney for the second time. Barney Britton, thank you for joining us. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. I think some uh, I will feel really bad and have to cut this if I'm wrong, but I think you're our first returning guest who does not work at Lens Rentals. So oh, thank oh. you. I think you're our first official friend of the show. I'm pretty sure that's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, thank so you. Thank, thank you for joining us again. I appreciate your expertise uh, with this topic we're going to cover today, which is a photo gear rodeo. Yeehaw. This is uh, we call these rodeos, Barney, to explain. <laughs> <laughs> I think we started with the phrasing roundup and accidentally wrote rodeo in an email one time and stuck with it. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're just going to cover some new photo gear we have, and it takes the form of a rodeo. Fantastic. Well, I've been to a couple of rodeos, so it's it's uh, it, none of this will be unfamiliar to me. That's wild. I've never been to a rodeo in my life. I live in Tennessee. You've never been, and to I've a rodeo? never been to a rodeo. I used to live in Colorado. We went to rodeos a few times. I just remember right. our, uh, kids clinging to the back of sheep, and that being an event. <laughs> <laughs> I'd watch that. I think I think other people saw that as well. I don't think yeah. that was something I made up. <laughs> no, that's that's a thing. That sounds adorable. <laughs> I got to seek this out. <laughs> All right, so we'll begin the rodeo. We're going to start uh, with a lens that we, as far as I know, do not have in stock yet. Do we? Well, I'll, I'll name it first, and then we'll figure it out. Uh, we're going to start with the Canon 5.2 millimeter f 2.8 dual fisheye, which is nuts. I don't know a ton about photography. I'll, we'll get into the specs. I was just very impressed with the look of this thing. Uh, Joey, do we have this yet? We as might this, have gotten it today. As of this recording, it's in house. I don't think it's listed on the site yet, but it might be by the time we release this. Episode. Yeah, I checked before recording, and it's not on the site. But I'm sure by the time we release this episode, long I after mean, recording, that I've, I've had my hands on it. Yeah, so. it'll so it'll be available. We'll link to it. And I, I guess since you've held it, Joey, can you tell us what's special about this lens? Uh, it's a dual fisheye lens. It's weird. Uh, it's two lenses for like stereoscopic 3d stuff but like it's fisheye so you're getting everything so you'd shoot and then you process it later into what you need it to but it's it looks like uh, you mount it to your camera it's about as wide as the camera because it's two lenses side by side onto a single mount and then it's just yeah it's weird it looks extremely cool it sort of looks like a little robot it does look like a robot. Yeah. Uh, specifically, it looks like the robot Johnny Five from Short Circuit. Oh my oh, God. It's got those two like big black round eyes. Classic. We will get into more scientific Number five, but, alive. But I, I'm impressed with the with the workflow. So it'll the R5 with a firmware update that I believe has already been released will go 8K up to 30P. So 8K footage that that should be plenty for it's a 180 degree field of view, um, and stereoscopic. So 8K, you'd be you'd be splitting that between two eyes, viewing it with some headset like the Quest 2. Right. Have any of you shot any VR footage yourselves? I have not, no. I have not. So I have I've done a little bit of VR filming, but mostly just watching stuff. We've been wanting to do an episode of the podcast about VR filmmaking. So I've been in the last couple of weeks going through and watching a ton of VR. And one of the things I kind of like about this 5.2 fisheye is the 180 degree field of view, which I, I think a lot of people sort of default to 360 for VR stuff. And I prefer the 180 degree format. Do you have much experience like watching VR content in that 180 degree field of view versus 360? I personally do not. Um, I have a oculus one of the oculus headsets like it's several generations old at this point and only ever really used it for like a couple like gaming aspects and i i still th i feel like vr is still in a lot of ways finding its footing it is yeah um, because it, it is sort of a cumbersome thing i know that new 
VR headsets don't require all the cables and all the sensors and different things like that. But it feels like it still has a long way to go. That said, like, you know, I had recently posted a, a review on the blog of the Insta 1R with the 360 degree lens. And I was really skeptical on kind of the 360 degree and that kind of like aspect ratio and stuff. But then when you really start like going through the workflow, it's kind of a fascinating way of making film. Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, I'm I'm curious what the uh you know what the software is going to be like. There's going to be a paid Premiere plugin and a paid like standalone stitching software from Canon. I think they're going to be subscription based, but we don't know a ton of details about that yet. Uh they said sometime early 2022 that'll be available. Um, but I'm curious how much that is even going to be necessary because there are a lot of VR tools in Premiere as it is. So it may not really, especially for somebody who already has Premiere, may not really be an essential thing. I'm curious, and and I don't think we would have any answers on this directly, but I guess I'm curious on how the lens itself works because you strap it to you know, a, a Canon R5, and that's a single, like a single sensor plane. So is there a, like a mirror box that's collecting these two lenses footage and putting it onto the single plane or, you know, how is it working exactly? I guess it would have to be. Have you shot with it or just, I, I know, stuck it on a camera. Well, I, if I remember right, you look in the back and you can see like a prism set up inside. So it is, it is outputting both image circles like side by side. Mm -hmm. And then it would be D it would be D warped. I assume in the software. Yeah. Although, you know, you're spending two grand on the lens. I don't know why Canon wouldn't just throw their software at you. But it's not, it, it didn't strike me as being that, honestly, given how specialized it likely is, it didn't strike me as being that expensive of a lens, actually. I was ex expecting it to be a little more. It's one of the cheapest RF lenses, like L series lenses that Canon's came out with so far. To put that in perspective, the 18 to, 8 to 15 L series fisheye is $1,200. And so this is like two of them side by side. Right. Kind of. I mean, kind of. they're covering a smaller area. So. Well, and it's also, it's also fascinating to see that it is F2.8, which that seems really fast for what this is, you know? Well, I mean, it's also, it's a 5.6 focal length. 5.2. 5.2, yeah. So it's, you know. Yeah, you're not getting any depth of field or anything like that from that. But I, I, I'm, right. I'm surprised that it didn't opt for like an F4. Um, right. Because I assume that this has two sets of aperture blades. Yeah, yeah, um, one for each side. Mm. It would also, without, I, I wouldn't want to hesitate at what the equivalence would be, but it would be, it would not be an f point, it, it would not be an f two point eight lens in equivalent terms, would it? Because it's covering a significantly smaller equivalent sensor area. So, right. I mean, f two eight would only be the amount of light it's. Able yeah. To so, in terms of in terms of your essentially your creative ability it's probably equivalent to something more like an f4 or 5.6 i would think but just that wild wild guess your depth of field is just basically like two feet to infinity mm -hmm. yeah which is good because i've i've seen some shorts recently that were like vr shorts that were shot with more traditional cameras and anything with depth of field is very disorienting and <laughs> yeah i'm going to be really interested to see what people shoot with it i think the ease of use of 180 degree field of view versus 360 is going to open it up to a lot more people and you know obviously being on like a canon r platform versus some specialized twenty thousand dollar 360 camera is a huge plus i think it'll be really really interesting i'm excited for this I did a review on the 85 millimeter DS, which was the defocus smoothing lens, which is also kind of a weird one that Canon came out with uh, last year or a couple of years ago now. And my takeaway from that was like, it's probably not for me, but I was really excited to see that Canon was just kind of going weird with it and was really hoping that they would continue to do that. And I feel like this lens is very evidence of that, that they're coming out with stuff like this before coming out with, you know, there, there's still a lot of pieces that are missing from the RF lineup, like a, a 200 millimeter prime. Yeah. So yes. it's kind of interesting to see that they've come out with a crazy dual fisheye lens and just kind of like really leaned heavily into like the weird creative ways of shooting. And I hope that they continue to do that. 
Right. Where did this, where did this come from? Like who was pushing for it hard enough for them to just be like, yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> especially, especially with the R3 coming it. out. Like, yeah, you would think they've got a sports capable camera. They'd want some more sports oriented lenses, but. Mm. And we'll cover that. We'll cover it. Yeah, we'll get there. Yeah. We'll Spoiler get there. alert. It's on the outline. <laughs> but first I want to also discuss the GFX 50 S2, uh, which we do have in stock and have been renting. Um, Zach, I want to get your perspective on this first because yeah. you shoot with the GFX, correct? In like yeah, I, a lot of your day to day work. Yeah, I moved to the GFX 100S about six months ago. I was able to get my hands on one and completely abandoned Canon. I've shot Canon for pretty much my entire career now. Moved to this camera because it felt like a camera built for me as a studio photographer. There was nothing that could really meet the resolution and everything. I'm really excited for this because a lot of the reason beyond just being too lazy to sell my Canon gear, I held on, I've held on to so many of my Canon bodies with, you know, my DSLRs because for the work that I do, I always want to have a backup camera. If something was to break or so on and I'm on set, I need to have a backup camera. So this camera seems like a perfect option as a backup camera alongside the 100S. You know, it's half the resolution. But otherwise, it's pretty much spec for spec identical, just with a pretty big resolution cut. And it just seems like an incredibly great camera for anybody that's a studio photographer that wants to shoot, you know, larger than 35 millimeter and doesn't need like the crazy autofocus speed and the crazy, you know, shooting speeds and stuff like that. This this camera is amazing. How fast is that autofocus on it? Uh, on the 100S? Yeah. It's a little clunky. Um, I only have the 120 millimeter uh, macro lens, okay. which I'm told is like a slower lens. Macros usually are. Um, so it's a little clunky, but it it's never slowed me down like to a noticeable amount. Like, like it, you're not going to go shoot skateboarders or anything, but. Yeah, probably. I mean, I, I think it, I, I wouldn't feel super comfortable with that, but I, I think it with in the right hand, somebody could probably do that. Mm -hmm. um, it just takes a little bit more finesse, but yeah, it's, it's not as fast as, you know, a lot of these new mirrorless cameras from like Canon and Sony and Nikon are really toting the like eye detection, super hyper fast focus, super, super accurate focus. And these mirrorless cameras are not, or these medium format cameras are not that, but they're also working with a significantly larger sensor as well. So yeah, yeah, for sure. The GFX 100S gets about as close as medium format gets, I think, to yeah. um, to to the sort of the autofocus specifications we've come to expect from DSLRs. There are a couple of pretty important caveats with the 50S Mark II, though, and they're both related <clears throat> to the fact that the the sensor is that first generation 50 megapixel sensor. So it's not bad, but technically it's really no better than the sensor, for example, in the Nikon Z7 Mark II at equivalent exposure settings. And the other main caveat is that you don't get the phase detection autofocus. So you've got the same autofocus system as the GFX 50S and, sorry, the G, uh, GFX, yes, the GFX 50S and the GFX 50R. So it's contrast detection. It's quite clunky. Even with one of Fujifilm's faster lenses, you're still not going to get the same sort of positive responsiveness that you would get from a GFX 100S or um, the GFX 100. So that's the same sensor that's in the the Hasselblad mirrorless. Yeah, same same silicon at least. Yeah, same base sensor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it's 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 a really really good sensor for the time, but it doesn't have the it 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 can't compete with the best in class full frame um, sensors that Sony Semiconductor are making now. So if you shoot a Z7 Mark II, for example, and you shoot at ISO sixty four, and you match exposure settings. The result, technically, the results you will get, dynamic range, resolution, detail, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, will basically be exactly comparable. There are reasons, there are compelling reasons to shoot the GFX, but they are more ergonomic. And, you know, depending on what kind of lenses you want, whether your needs are met by lenses in their range. But it's not, I think, for people expecting it to be, a, you know, a, a, a sort of budget almost like a budget alternative to the GFX 100S. It, it definitely is that, but with some fairly important caveats. Honestly, I mean, the, 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 the extra that you pay for the 100S over the 50S Mark II is very, very much worth it because the, sense, the 100 megapixel sensor is a whole new generation ahead in terms of 
in terms of um, technology and it just has so many benefits. Right. All right. I think we'll take a quick break right there. And when we come back, we'll talk about some of the new mirrorless bodies from the from the big three manufacturers. Want a discount on your next order from Lens Rentals? Head to lensrentals.com slash podcast or follow the link in the show notes for a coupon code. As the largest online photo and video equipment rental house in the world, Lens Rentals has been supplying both professionals and hobbyists for over 15 years. We carry everything from cameras and lenses to drones, computers, even VR headsets, all shipped straight to your door for whatever length of time you need. Rent the gear you need to get the shot and grab a discount at lensrentals.com slash podcast. That's lensrentals.com slash podcast. Welcome back to the Lens Rentals podcast. We're all such fans of the Fuji GFX series that we actually kept talking during the break. So you're joining us right in the middle of a conversation. Don't worry, though. I'm sure you'll be able to catch up. I took a GFX 100 to Iceland a couple of years ago. Yeah. Just to do like landscape stuff. And I really wish I'd had something a lot smaller. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even the body isn't even so huge. It's those lenses. are really The big. lenses are huge. The but if huge. the body were smaller, it would definitely help yeah. um, and that's where i think a 50s mark ii might have an advantage for like a travel landscape it definitely camera. does i mean it's it's so much so much more practical i i do love the gfx 100 but mm. it, that thing is is overbuilt <laughs> it's so overbuilt it's a tank and a half it's bigger than the i think it's bigger than the flagship bodies from it's, the other it's pretty much when you would put the if you take the viewfinder off so it just becomes a square Mm -hmm. It basically fills the same size in your in your, uh, in your camera bag as like a Nikon D3 or D5 would. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, 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 the 100S is about this. I think they're identical in size to the 50S. Yeah, very similar. And Yeah, no, they are. They're the same body. Um, and then, then they're equivalent in size to a D850 or, an, or a 5D Mark IV, as you said. Which is beautiful. You can put this in if you want. We probably will, yeah. <laughs> but the, the, in fact, assume we will. Our listeners are joining us mid-conversation. <laughs> we'll the GFX 100, the only reason I would recommend anyone consider that over the 100S is durability, actually. Um, having seen them put it together, there's a, there's a sub-chassis inside which all the components are attached to and then, a, um, and then the body frame on top of that. So it's extraordinarily rugged. Um, yeah. As I'm sure you guys know from 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 servicing them from time to time, right. the difference between the construction of that and the 100s for some people will be worth it, but for most of the rest of us, it, it's 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 just a you know it's a it's a detail. But. Mainly moving on because I feel like this is going to take us a long time to cover. We're this is probably the biggest release of the year, the Canon EOS R3. Yeah, uh, which we don't have yet. I don't think we will have by the time this episode comes out. Uh, I don't know what the release date is. Yeah, do any, any of y'all know the release date on that? Um, I think they they've talked about it being. I don't know. It may have been pushed back. They, I think B and H has expected availability. Shipping will begin Friday, November twenty sixth. Yeah, oh. they they had said mid to late oh. October, and I, if I remember correctly, but that may have just been what they said to us informally. But it, I think it got delayed. I think it got pushed. Back. Okay. I mean, so yeah, there likely won't be a rent, you know, you won't be able to rent it by the time this episode comes out likely. If, I don't know where it is in the schedule, but there will be a pre-order link. If they're uh, saying the late November, there will be a link to something in the show notes. I mean, we already have a pre-order page up, so. And I'm coming from a place of mostly ignorance on Canon's RF stuff. Is this essentially their equivalent to like the 1DX, but with an RF mount? Basically, yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay. There are there are some differences. I mean, they're not they're not claiming that it has quite the same level of durability, um, but to all intents and purposes, yeah. And the the one DX is largely aimed towards professional photographers, primarily sports, correct? Mostly sports, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, sports and photojournalism. And the R three has the exact same is is aimed at exact exactly the same kind of people. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, what features in the upcoming R3 are specifically aiming to capture that market that, say, the R5 doesn't have? It's just a, it, it's a lot faster. Um, it's, obviously, its battery life is significantly better um, because it has, it has the, batteries. yeah, though it has the same battery as the 1DX uh, Mark II takes, I believe. So you won't get the same stamina as the 1DX Mark II, but you'll get a lot more than you would from an R5. 
Mm -hmm. um, it also has the next generation of uh, dual pixel CMOS autofocus, so it's a lot closer. It, I, our experience thus far suggests it falls a little short, but it's a lot closer to the experience of using something like a Sony A1 or a Sony A9 Mark II. In terms which of are its also very good. tracking, which are which are currently um, the the Z9 is the only sort of question mark here, but the A1 and, uh, and the and the A9 Mark II are basically sort of recognized best in class for autofocus currently. Right. So yeah, the R3 gets a lot closer than the R5, but it, it's really, you know, it's designed for photojournalists. It's designed for sports photographers. It's it's not, and it's priced accordingly. It's not going to be an enthusiast mass market camera, and that's that's. That's fine, you know. It's for shooting the Olympics. I guess but nobody here shoots sports professionally, but especially Joey, you've talked to a lot of people on the phone. Is the lack of a? I'm sure there's a word for this that I don't know. The viewfinder is a screen instead of a mirror. I mean, lag is, is still a, lag is still a concern, an issue. Like I used to shoot a lot of roller derby, and right. This was back when the D5 was new. Mm -hmm. um, and people, I knew photographers that were using the Fuji bodies and the Sony bodies. And EVF lag has always been a real concern uh, because with a the DSLR, there is no lag. Like you're watching the moment happen. So there's a, as the cameras get newer and newer, there is less and less lag. Um, but at some point, you just learn to anticipate it. Okay. And I guess it can't be too significant right it's i wasn't even really thinking of lag as the issue that people would have a problem with more just like looking at a screen instead of looking through a viewfinder it just seems like somebody who does it professionally would get like very used to working a certain way and that seems like a hurdle to me right. i wasn't even aware lag was well and a, a lot thing. a lot of them a lot of the ones i've talked to aren't even shooting single images they're just doing bursts so yeah they're compensating that for that anyway the R3 is the is the closest we've ever seen to an optical viewfinder uh, in an electronic viewfinder. It's extremely, extremely good. It's one of the the standout selling points actually of of the camera compared to what else is on the market. It's a very high dynamic range finder. It's very, very fast. So it's after a while you use it for a little bit, and really you you just disappear into it. You forget that it is actually an electronic finder. So I think that's worth calling out. That is a differentiator, certainly against other models in Canon's range. And it's again, it's, it's because it's designed for people who can't afford to, quote unquote, miss the moment, you know. Mm -hmm. And if you ask Canon, why is it taking you so long to get around to making a pro mirrorless camera? They'd, they'd, that's what they'd say. You know, we couldn't afford to make one that didn't meet or exceed the standards set by DSLR. It also, I forgot to mention when we, when we were talking about um, ways in which it differentiates itself, it also brings back eye control autofocus, which is... Really, really cool, and um, and and finally does exactly what it is that we all thought it was meant to do in the '90s. It actually works now. It's really good, and it's very you you start using it, and you just you sort of again you just sort of forget that you never you forget that you ever didn't use it. It's very intuitive. Do you know what this is, Ryan? I have an idea, but I've never used a camera that has it. The, the camera senses where your eye is pointing in the viewfinder and focuses there. That mm -hmm. is extremely cool. It's yeah. the coolest thing ever. Yeah, they developed it in the early 90s with uh, what we called in Europe the EOS 5. I think you guys called it the Elan A2. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it was developed through three or four iterations and sort of reached its technical peak in the EOS 3 in 1998. But they fussed with it with a couple more lower-end models after that, but it basically wasn't used again. And, and it sort of was thought to be a dead technology because it, it worked really well for some people. It never quite did what it was built to do and it was not that reliable for people who wore glasses or had certain kinds of color or shapes of eye so they, they couldn't really ever put it in a pro body because they couldn't quite ever guarantee that it would definitely work and there are still some caveats with the system now if you have apparently if you have very very pale blue eyes certain kinds of ocular conditions um, you might find that its reliability is a bit reduced or a bit affected but it's in, in, compared to the iterations we've seen in the film bodies, it is extraordinarily reliable and very, very versatile. And 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 yeah. So if you if you say to someone, you know, this thing has eye control, it focuses where your eye looks. It actually does that. Uh, whereas in the old days, there were caveats like, oh, but you've got to keep your eye still, position your pupil, half press the button. You know, it wasn't tied to autofocus tracking, whereas now it is. So now when you're shooting sports or anything fast moving, 
it is a genuinely faster way of actually acquiring initial focus. That's wild. Yeah, yeah. it's very, it's very cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> sounds incredible. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't cool. realize. So you have actually had like some hands-on time with this camera. Yeah, we've we've shot with it a little bit. Yeah, um, we had um, we had a uh, forget if we had a day or two days. We, we've had yes, we have had some time with it. We published a whole gallery of samples a, a while back when it was released. Yeah, ergonomically, is it pretty similar to like the use experience of like a one DX? Um, it's similar. I mean, it, it's it's sort of basically imagine an R five with a with a permanently attached vertical grip. And you're pretty much there. There are there are some similarities with the One DX series, just for the sake of um, you know ergonomic continuity. Um, it's kind of a midpoint. It's sort of I think they probably will do an R1 at some point. You know they they are probably reserving the right to do that. But anyone coming from an R5 would be perfectly able to make the adjustment. Equally, anyone coming from a 1DX Mark II would be able to make the adjustment. It's it's a really nice sort of midpoint. I mean, a lot of people, to get the most out of the 1DX Mark III in some respects, you put the camera in live view mode anyway. That's when you got the silent shutter. That's when you got the speed. That's when you got the the really good you know dual, dual CMOS sort of focus. So there will be some 1DX Mark II users who are already used to basically locking the mirror up. And that's getting you pretty close to a, an R3 shooting experience, just without the mirror, of course, ever. Right. What I'm always, like, what I'm fascinated by, and I'm a firm believer that time isn't real, and yeah. <laughs> the last two years have proven that, but like the release cycle of this, because the R3 and very much so the, you know, what we'll be talking about later, the Z9, are the two kind of flagship sports cameras that always seem to like release in conjunction with like the Olympics or, you know, some major sporting event that was about to take place. Mm -hmm. um, and with the Olympics delayed last year, a whole year, it just seems like the the release cycle of this is, is kind of weird. And, and sort of what we had talked about just a moment ago on as Canon's developing their RF lens lineup, they don't really have a whole lot tailored to the sports photographers and the wildlife photographers and these people that would probably benefit from having the super fast speed of a camera like this? Well, they do and they don't. I mean, the, the, the benefits of native mirrorless lens design are chiefly felt in the, at the wide end of the ranges. So, you know, although there is a benefit in terms of communication speed of a native RF lens compared to an adapted EF lens, the chances are that, well, no, it's literally true that the, if you're if you're using a, a recent generation long tele fast EF lens with an adapter, you're not going to see a problematic drop in performance on the R3. Sure. So yeah, it's pretty seamless, you know. And and the the size of the adapter, it's smaller than the teleconverter that you probably would have on there anyway. So you've got all those lenses already. And they're going to work perfectly well on the R3. You know, where, where you see the benefits of, of the ground up mirrorless lens design really are sort of standard wide zooms and ultra wides. So I think yeah. they they felt pretty confident and, and 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 legitimately so. You know, and Nikon's the same. And no one's really rushing to make native mirrorless super long tellies, or at least it wasn't what they did straight out the gate because the performance with adapted existing adapted lenses was more than good enough. That's that's a fair point. I I guess I've always had like the framework of like if you're going to use lens adapters as a like transitional product, that certainly doesn't hold true if you're buying, you know, 500 millimeter lenses that cost 10 grand. Exactly. It's a real pain to use a lens adapter on a 16 to 35 or a 24 to 70, but by the time you're getting up into those into those high uh, long uh, tele primes, it's it's much much less of a pain pain barrier. True. Yeah. I think my only real qualm with the R3 is they did it with this camera like they've done it with many of their other cameras. It's dual slot, but it's not two of the same slot. <laughs> and like Nikon has always made their flagship body two of the same slots. And I think that's a better idea. Mm. That is weird. Is it CF Express and SD? Yeah. yeah. UHS2 compatible. Yeah, and it doesn't. It, it's uh, unlike Nikon. It's not. There's no dual compatibility with XQD. It's just um, CF Express. Yeah, and I think that's fine. But oh, that's yeah. That's no. I mean, kind of never really. But why not just make it two CF? Why not just make it two CF Express slots? Yeah. What do you think is the thought process there beyond 
cost, but it can't be all that expensive. I'll tell you one possible reason. <laughs> it would be heat. Um, uh, oh, yeah. It's uh, yeah, those those um, CF Express cards get pretty hot, and it was a big problem in the R5. I mean, one of the hottest components in the R5 when people did that, you know, when they were rabbit holing down the thermal testing at the time of its you know overheat issues. People were taking infrared camera um, footage of the back of an R5, and it, and it was the the CF Express interface and the card itself that was often among the hottest components in the camera. So that's one possible reason to be thermal management. I suspect that Canon would probably just tell you it's to basically make the camera as versatile as they could for as many people as as possible. You know, um, cheaper card for overflow, for backup. For I think you can also I believe I'm right in saying that you can copy firmware, not um, you know, custom settings to one card and transfer them to other cameras using SD cards. There's things like that. I think they'd probably just say it was so that they didn't. I mean, Nikon let you do that with any card. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure what the logic is Canon would give you, but I, I strongly suspect it would basically just be they they wanted to make sure the camera was as versatile as possible. It's still annoying. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I I agree with you. <laughs> you guys, like you guys mentioned, Canon's still developing the RF lens lineup, and there seem to be some holes. What would you want to see? I guess I'll go around the table one at a time. What would you want to see in the line lens lineup that isn't already there? Who do you want to go first? Uh, let's go Joey first. Uh, Just because I'm looking right at Joey. <laughs> honestly, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. There do seem to be, I was looking through the lineup today, and there seems to be sort of a, there aren't a ton of long range zooms beyond 200. Yeah, but. But like Arnie again, was saying, I, yeah, that seem, it seems like less of a pain to use an adapter when you're using a big long lens like that. Right. And I've actually done a lot of that. And. I can't tell a difference. I really can't mm -hmm. in performance. And so all of those long lenses are so great already. I'm not in really a rush to get a new one. Yeah. I, the 200 would be nice if it were native. Yeah, that makes sense. And Especially I, can, presumably they could make it smaller. Just like they did the 70 to 200. Right. Because that, that is a marvel of a lens. I love that lens. I wish it took teleconverters though. Yeah. Yeah, I do wish that. Um, but other than that, I think I'd like to see some faster wide primes, some alternatives. Well, I guess is the widest prime they have right now the fourteen. Oh, yeah. Uh, do they have a native fourteen for RF? I don't think they have a native fourteen. Oh, I'm thinking of the yeah. The I'm Sigma. thinking of the EF. They have a yeah. sixteen. They have they have a newish, um, fairly inexpensive sixteen mil prime. I think. Yeah. And they have the fourteen to thirty five. Obviously, the the, the zoom. So a 200 prime is what you would like to see? Yeah. Yeah. If I had to, if I had to put a pin on it, yeah. How about you, Barney? What do you think? Um, I, I think they've made some gestures in this direction, including the 16 mil um, prime that's very recently announced. I'd like to see them making some slightly lower cost, uh, lower size and weight prime lenses for enthusiasts and hobbyists. They're, they've got a couple, but I think one of the things that... I like, I value so much about the Nikon Z range is that you've got that 3518, the 2418, the 281 the 518, the 85 1.8. And I believe I'm right in saying they're all under a grand and they're really yeah. good and they're not the fastest and they're not the, you know, fanciest, but they're really, really good and pretty affordable. And that's great. And I, I think that's, you know, smart. And I think that's very customer friendly. Whereas certainly for for quite a long time, the RF lens mount, really with the exception of the twenty four to one hundred five, pretty much everything in there for quite a while was very very costly, and um, the thirty five one point eight macro is a nice lens, but it's not their best, and it definitely doesn't compare as, uh, compared to the likes of the Nikon Z fifty and, and thirty five. So, I just would like to see them throwing the enthusiast to bone, um, I think, and, and and developing some lenses that don't. Don't cost you know one to two to three thousand dollars. Yeah, like a a forty five two eight pancake or something would be exactly cool. yeah something like that you know and it's I'm sure they I'm sure they will um, but it certainly does feel with the RF range and a little bit so with the Sony range too the, the cost of entry is pretty high and it would be nice to see some some options a bit lower down. Yeah, yeah. and that has to be inevitable if they're planning on this being just 
you know, their lens format for the future. Eventually. Oh, absolutely. You have yeah. to do something like that. And they've got the cameras, you know, uh, they've, they've got the R6 and they've, even the RP, but they don't have a lot of lenses that sort of really feel commensurate to those cameras in terms of the quality price ratio, I would say. Yeah. yeah. How about you, Zach? Any preferences? I mean, I'm with Joey on, I would love to see a 200 millimeter. Selfishly, I would love to see them bring back the 200 millimeter f 1.8. Yes, <laughs> yes, um, yes. I'm with you on that. I recognize that is very selfish of me. I realize it's very much a niche lens. Um, I've used the Canon vanity lens. <laughs> yeah, I've used the Canon uh, EF version of it, and it is magical with plenty of flaws, uh, especially compared to the f2 version. But uh, I would love for them to bring that back. I would love to see. Just a lot of really, really fast lenses. And then I think the obvious thing that the RF lineup's missing right now is a professional grade 35 millimeter. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. they've got they've got the 35 millimeter F1.8, but you would have to assume that a 1.4 L is on the horizon, or you know, fingers crossed, even a 1.2. The one point four eight, it is is it's not bad, but it's it's really not it's really not great either. Yeah, I would I would love to see yeah uh, a professional grade thirty five millimeter in the RF lineup. It's obviously an extremely popular focal length, uh, and it's a pretty obvious hole in their uh, in their lens lineup right now. And Nikon's as well, actually. Although the thirty five one point eight is is adequate, but um, yeah, a, a, a high quality thirty five one point four for both those systems mm -hmm. would be fantastic. Well, let me ask you guys this: so we are running sort of long. Does anybody have any uh, super huge interest in the A7 IV? Should I just skip it and get to the Z9? I mean, we can do it if you want to. If, if there's something that you want to cover. I but mean, if you, like me, are not especially interested in the A7 IV, it just, it's I'm another, happy to It's another it. incremental upgrade. Yeah. They're going to sell a bunch of them. <laughs> sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, we'll rent it. I'm, yeah. I'm sure it's a great camera. Yeah. In fact, I'll probably leave this in so people don't write us emails being like, why didn't you talk about the A7 IV? I'm going to be honest. I'm sure it's going to be great. We'll probably do an episode on it once we have it in hand. We I just have, don't have it in hand yet. I haven't been excited about a single thing out of Sony in four years. Oh, no. Now people uh -oh. will write us emails. Now the emails that. are coming in. A1 is cool. I mean, it's not that they haven't put out good stuff, but it's just, all right. You, they're you re their release schedule is little... very busy. It's yeah. so busy. They're putting Everything's out of incremental. Out. and. That's cool, but you know, it's nothing to get excited about. That's there's no pizzazz. The only thing I will say about the A7 IV, and actually to Sony's credit, I think the A1 was really exciting. A9 Mark II was pretty spectacular. Some of their lenses have been absolutely superb. The A7 IV, it, it is an incremental update, but the changes do make a significant difference to the operation and handling of the camera. Like they have made a big um they've made big improvements to the to the ui and that was yes long overdue um but it does make the a7 IV uh, a sub substantially more um enjoyable camera to actually hold and use so you know in the in a world of incremental updates to be fair those are the kind of updates that we like to see yeah and those updates are really good you got the um, oversampled 4k uh you got the bluetooth connection um that cinetone color mode I love their cine color modes. Yeah, I think they're great. S log is great. Yeah, we'll we'll talk about. I, it. I don't mean to say that mm -hmm. I don't like Sony. I yeah. just it doesn't excite me. They make good stuff. They make yeah. good stuff. This is the problem with media. We can't like. It's not going to make for a flashy podcast episode to talk <laughs> no. about the small but <laughs> very helpful updates that. So we appreciate it, but we, you know, we'll cover it. We'll cover it in the end of the year round. Now, if only the lenses didn't suck. Oh, <laughs> oh no! <laughs> we'll cover that another time too. Well, gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what we'll do then is uh, move on to something I'm I'm really curious about because I I don't know a lot about the you know internal industry machinations is the Nikon Z9, which seems to me like a pretty important release for Nikon to catch up a little bit of lost ground in like the mirrorless area. Um, Barney, you probably know the most about this upcoming camera um can you give us a quick rundown of what we can expect from the nikon z9 uh yeah i mean it's, it's all um it's all public now it's it's they, they've been talking about it uh being a 
in terms of a D3 moment, uh, you might see that expression floating around launch content. What they really sort of mean by that is that the, what they what they want, what they hope, and and what they cautiously expect of the Z9 is that it will have the same sort of energizing effect on the lineup and on um, their perception among professionals as the D3 did in 2007. Because <clears throat> for those of us with long memories who've been in the industry for a long time, <laughs> the D3 was an absolute game changer. And it, and it came along at a point when Canon had really kind of eaten Nikon's lunch for a, a long time. Um, Nikon didn't have a full-frame camera. Canon, I think, was on its fourth or fifth generation of full-frame camera by the time the D3 came along. So Nikon really had lost a step and they didn't have the image quality that Canon had. They didn't have the autofocus technology that Canon had. They didn't have the sensors that Canon had. Everything that Nikon was doing was perfectly workmanlike and and good and solid and, and fine. But Canon had a significant technical lead and Canon was just cooler. They were doing more. They were doing it better. And they were the you know best in class in terms of autofocus and resolution and they had full frame sensors and they had APS-H sensors and Nikon was still still you know trucking along with APS-C with what they called DX format. So the D3 when it showed up was a big deal because it was full frame. But it was also it was a significantly better camera technically. Its image quality was absolutely superb. It instantly set a new standard for low light imaging. It instantly set a new standard for autofocus technology with the um I don't know if it I could, this may be incorrect. I, I can't remember if it was the first camera that offered 3D autofocus tracking. I think it was. It was the first one that had enough AF points that it actually meant something. They had 51 AF points, which is in, even more than, than Canon at that point, and a lot more than Nikon had ever done. So the D3 overnight basically pulled Nikon back in the game. And a lot of people, myself included actually, switched systems to the D3. I used to be a music photographer, and the advantages the D3 offered over what I was using at the time were well worth the cost of switching systems. It really was that that much better than anything else out there. So Nikon's hoping, and they're pitching the Z9 as basically, it's 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 like a D3, but for but for the mirrorless age. You know, everyone thought we were behind the times. Everyone thought we were not releasing enough innovation. Everybody thought that other competitors had sort of taken the technical lead. Well, here you go. Here's our answer to that. It's the Z9. You know, and. Quite honestly, we we have used uh, pre-production samples um, a, a little a little while ago now, and and really, it checks out. I mean, the Z9 is, from our initial impressions, at least competitive with Sony and Canon in every respect that you might care about. It's incredibly fast. Its autofocus is extremely reliable. Uh, it, it brings back 3D AF tracking for mirrorless, and it's extraordinary. I mean, it blows the D5, D6 out of the water and say nothing of the Z7 II and Z6 II. So it is a massive leap forward. I mean, the only thing about it, which I think will, um, you know, some people won't take to it just for the fact that it's, it's, a, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty big and pretty heavy camera. You know, it's, it's 20% smaller than a D6, but D6 is a very big camera. So, you know, it doesn't have the advantage of the A1 it's only a one of being able to operate without a vertical grip. Um, obviously, it has a vertical grip integrated. So it is still a pro's camera, but it's priced quite aggressively. It's priced at $5,500, which is a lot of money. It's still priced outside the range of a lot of photographers, if not most. But it's not that much more expensive than a D850. That they, What they're really hoping is that D850 users who've been sort of waiting this will be the camera that might get them to switch because it's thousand dollars less than D6. It's in real dollar terms thousand dollars less than D3 was when it was announced. It is aggressively priced, and it's really, really good. And it had to be, uh, it had to be both aggressively priced and it had to be really, really good. So yeah, we are so far very, very impressed by it. Um, obviously, full testing remains to be remains to be completed, but pretty much seems to check all the boxes. What are your impressions of the Z lens lineup, like in contrast to the RF stuff? Um, I mean, I'm a I'm a, a fan of the Z lens lineup for the reasons like I talked about a little bit earlier. I think it's they've got options for everybody in whatever price point. You know, that some of their their primes really are excellent and aren't that costly. Um, the 24 to 70 is one of the best lenses of its kind out there. 70 to 200 2.8 is the same. And that does take the two teleconverters. And actually with a 1.4 teleconverter, that 70 to 200 becomes a super useful 300 mil equiv as well. 
So I'm a fan of their lens lineup. And alongside the Z9, they launched the 24 to 120, which um, we have no reason to think will not be perfectly perfectly good. It is an S-line lens, and they haven't released a disappointing S-line lens so far. And they've also announced the development of a 400mm f2.8 um, native Z. Um, so they you know they they're working on it um they've had a they've had a tricky year and a half like everybody um possibly more tricky than than some manufacturers but they they're doing it and their roadmaps looking pretty strong so do you feel like this is a hail mary for them um i don't know really i mean i think it's it's tempting people always sort of talk in sports metaphors when they talk about the camera industry i suppose yeah. you know, enthusiasts of any industry talk in sports metaphors about it but I, I think Nikon is one of those companies where they definitely have lost a step. You know, uh, Sony really has been very aggressive and Sony has really challenged Nikon and, so, and, Nikon and Canon's traditional dominance and, and Sony's taken a, a, a really strong um, uh, lead in, in, some, in some territories and they had an early lead in full frame mirrorless, obviously. But Nikon have been around, they Nikon know what they're doing. You know, they're smaller than they were. Their lineup is smaller than it was. They've had to make some decisions. They've consolidated manufacturing. You know, it, it's, it was, a lot of people sort of wrote them off. It always seemed to me a bit hasty <laughs> because if anyone knows how to, how to make, you know, pretty, pretty good pro mirrorless, uh, sorry, pro enthusiast and professional cameras, you know, it, it's Nikon. Will they ever be number one again? I don't know. Will they ever be even number two after, after Canon or Sony? I, I don't know. But, you know, if, if, if they've got a Z8 in the works, which you can bet they do at some point, which brings, which brings us the same or similar sensor from the Z9 into a smaller enthusiast form factor, that's the D850 all over again. That thing's still back-ordered as far as I know. So, you know, they, are, they know how to make good cameras. And um, if the Z9's any indication, then they, they, they really nailed it. It's very, very good. It, it, we really hoped it would be. A game changer, and it 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 really it's it, so far at least impressions are very very positive. So, I think the challenge they'll have is supplying them. I mean, it's they 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 haven't made a they haven't made a secret of of some of the supply chain challenges they've had over the past eighteen months. But uh, yeah, everybody's we'll, running we'll into see. that. Yes, yeah, Nick, Nikon especially. I think that they they the COVID sort of came along at the same time as they were consolidating all the manufacturing in Thailand. So they they had a, a double a double hit. So, Joey, I know you were a Nikon photographer for a long time. Yeah, my last Nikon body I owned was the D3. Nice. And, uh, you know, Barney, back in your uh, music photography days, it sounds like you used a lot of Nikon as well. Mm, D3 and D3S. I still have my D3S. Nice. This might be like too, I don't know, nebulous and wishy-washy a question, but I've always been curious, uh, especially back in like, you know, the D3 era. Nikon photographers were very loyal to Nikon as a brand. How do you think Nikon at that time and now, how do you define it as a brand? What is the sort of defining characteristic that makes it different from Canon? Um, I think that's a very difficult question to answer. And I think, to be honest, I think Nikon would probably struggle to answer it as well. Uh, I think Nikon has struggled to carve out a brand identity in the past few years. Um, in the face of, you know, incredible innovation and rapid iteration from its competitors. But really, Nikon sees itself still, I think, as a image quality first, no compromise company. You know, slow and steady, but with the ability to change the game when they want to and when they're ready. And honestly, I think a pretty unimpeachable reputation for reliability as well. Um, one of the things, I mean, I know you guys have done teardowns of the Z6 and Z7. They are extremely well built. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, they are probably better built than they really need to be. And I think that's something that Nikon users back in the day, myself included, really appreciated. The, the, those, the cameras are, are very, very well, well put together. So yeah, I don't know whether they would... They, I, I haven't looked whether they've unveiled a new slogan alongside the, the the Z9. They may have done, but they've certainly talked to us in terms of just being a really no compromise, reliable imaging tool. That's what Nikon makes. That's what it knows how to do, and that's what it does well. I'm going to give you a nebulous answer to a nebulous question. Oh, great! <laughs> Ye yellow. <laughs> <laughs> I do like the yellow. Canon's red. Nikon's yellow. I like look. <laughs> 
You could do worse than yellow. I like that yellow. I'm into it. Sony doesn't really have a color, do they? Mm, Orange. They have. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Orange. Sort of marine, marine buoy, orange. Yeah, Um, that's it. I talked to a guy who who got a job at Nikon a few years ago, actually, and he said one of the questions that he was asked in the interview by someone very senior said, "If I cut you in half, would you bleed yellow?" Huh. <laughs> he said, and he said, uh, he said "Yes, right. yes, I would." Wow. And he got the job. So, yeah, That's, I, I, would say, I hope they didn't test that. <laughs> I haven't heard from him for a while, actually. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the only photography-related tattoo I have is a Nikon lens. Oh. It's the old 58 1.2. Nice. <laughs> well, uh, we'll have to get you to review it for the blog. I want to I want to see if you can, you know, rediscover the old passion for Nikon. I mean, Nikon. if I could find one, Jesus. Yeah, it'll <laughs> I'm sure we'll have it, to Was it a, a to keep them on the shelves? Was it a, a Noct, the original the original Noct? Yeah, the original. Oh, yeah. Well, those mm-hmm. things, what do they go for now? Six, five or six thousand dollars? Yeah, five or six thousand if you can find them. Wow. We'll snap a photo. I'll put it in the show notes for the episode. Look, look for, look for Joey's it's the lens, diagram. lens tattoo. Yeah. One thing before we leave the Z9, sorry, I forgot to mention alongside, actually in connection with the R3 as well, both the R3 and the Z9 featured stack CMOS sensors, which is a very, very big deal. Um, it's what basically allows them to be as fast and as multi-role capable as they are. Um, obviously Sony got there first, but uh, yeah, Nikon uh, are using a Sony, uh, almost certainly a Sony semiconductor sensor but nikon designed and canon's using its own developed in-house but it does make a huge difference to their feature sets yeah that was in my outline and i completely passed over it can you explain what effect that has on autofocus why it improves autofocus performance i can i can try yeah um i'm 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 by far i'm i'm far and away being being deep reviews in-house expert on that but basically it's it me a stack CMOS sensor has memory on the actual sensor itself, so the speed so the 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 speed of the sensor is vastly increased the amount of data that it can process in a given time. So it allows for things like extremely rapid autofocus um, calculations, 120 per second, I believe, is what the Z9 will do, and very fast frame rate shooting and it also allows for high resolution high frame rate video and etc cetera, etc cetera. so that i i th- believe i'm right saying in a nutshell it's basically all about speed of data transfer okay yeah that makes sense it's, and i guess it would presumably improve performance in those sorts of modes that require a little bit more calculation like a car tracking or person tracking or eye tracking that kind of exactly those yeah. things that would require more data yep yeah, it makes the whole sensor by stacking the three layers. You've got your your photo sites, then your logic, and then your memory. Mm-hmm. Okay. And it also allows, so the readout, the fast readout speed extends to video as well. So it allows for very low rolling shutter video. Mm-hmm. Oh, great. Yeah, because that has, that has always been a problem with yeah. these mirrorless. Another thing it allows, again, because of the fast readout, is it lets you get up to almost mechanical shutter ratings for um, flash sync. Hell yeah. Wow. So you could, with the R3, you can shoot with flash up to 180th of a second, and I think the Z9 is 1 200th of a second. The Z9, the Z9, it should also be mentioned, does not have a mechanical shutter at all. It is a fully electronic shutter camera. So there are blades that will close over the shutter, sorry, over the sensor when the camera is turned off. They're purely protective. It is in electronic mm. shutter mode all the time. And, That's uh, interesting. Yeah, and according to Nikon, and again, in our own initial testing, this this holds true there really is no downside um i've shot tennis with the z9 and the amount of distortion on a moving tennis ball is is minimal you know it, it may there may be a little compared to mechanical shutter but there is practically no compromise at all to it being fully electronic so that's you know that's a really really big deal uh you can shoot we're almost at global shutter level Pretty much. And honestly, you know, I, I've made this mistake, I think, even on the last Lens Rentals podcast of talking about global shutter as if it was something that, you know, would change the game if it came along. It probably doesn't need to. I mean, to any practical intents and purposes, by the time you've got a shutter that reads out as fast as this generation of stack CMOS sensors does, yeah, that's practically speaking, though that's the benefit of global shutter right there. So we've kind of, we've kind of, Beyond, gone beyond the need for global shutter, arguably, I think, in cameras of this type. There could be, and there is a role for it in 
cameras of different types and different form factors and industrial cameras. Mm -hmm. But for the cameras we're talking about, by the time you've got stacked CMOS that can read out one two thousand one two hundredth of a second, I mean you're you're practically there, really. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's exciting. I'm yeah, I'm excited so. to get my hands on this stuff and hopefully try it out, write some articles. Joey, we're gonna get you on the blog article for Nikon. All right. We're gonna do it. All right. <laughs> if you got the tattoo now, you you have to do it. I mean, I'll have the time this winter, so <laughs> All right. Well, Barney, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate your time. No, of course. Anytime. Happy to be a friend of the show. Yeah, yeah. We'll have you on again soon. I've never been a friend of any show. <laughs> well, you're a friend of this show, Barney. <laughs> well, anytime. Thanks, guys. We'll talk again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Lynch Rentals podcast. When he's not a guest on our show, Barney Britton is the senior editor of DP Review. There's a lot of news and review type photography media out there, and I have to say a lot of it is not good. DP Review stands above the rest of the crowd by putting a ton of work into their reviews and publishing work from people who really know what they're talking about. We'll link to them in the show notes. As always, make sure to visit lensrentals.com slash podcast for a discount on your next order from us. And if you're enjoying the show, you can support it by subscribing and giving us a review on Apple Podcasts. We're on Instagram and Twitter at Lens Rentals, and thanks to Jacques Granger for our theme music. More of his work can be found at revengebodymemphis.bandcamp.com. On the next episode of the Lens Rentals podcast, we're starting our year in review. We'll wrap up 2021 by talking about our favorite products of the year, what's going on with the industry in general, and what we might be able to expect from 2022 on the next episode of the Lens Rentals podcast. Mm-hmm.